Yeah, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. I know quite a few of you, um, and I know a lot of you have had the tools for many years um, that we've been creating them, especially Judy. She has some of our original Wi-Fi rings from who knows how long ago. And, um, and then I know there's a lot of you who uh, this is your first time and experience with the tools and, and with me and the work that we do. Um, so again, Brian Besco uh, with Twisted Sage Studios in Buffalo Gap, South Dakota. Uh, it's a tiny little town of 124 people. Um, you know, we have all of our gravel roads, you can find rose quartz on, kicking around and all that fun stuff there in the hills. Um, so w the studio that we started, uh, gosh, it's been about 11 years ago that uh, we began doing this work. And this work, as we call it, is, we like to call it consciousness work for a lack of better terms. Um, so what we're going to do today is guided journey work, which we just simply call consciousness work. Um, and we'll have you know, a lot of experiential, hands-on things we're going to be doing, as well as a lot of stories. And so as soon as I see you guys falling asleep, we'll take breaks and do more hands-on stuff. Um, but we always begin from within the sacred space of the heart. Now, my sister is my sister Brenda, Brenda Schnoes. She channels an energy group called the Elders Three. She started doing this back in 2011. Um, and they just bring through simple heart-based messages on simple daily living. Um, pretty phenomenal stuff. And that's about the time that I started to get into this work uh, was with my sister. Um, so actually, let me take a step back and I need to do a couple of housekeeping things first before we really get started here. That is, is we are going to be filming today and we're filming right now. So if you don't want to be on the camera, just don't step up in the middle aisle right here. Um, go that way if you, if you don't want to be on the camera today. Um, and so we will provide each of you guys with this, with this film. Uh, so that way you don't have to take extensive notes. You can go back through all the different meditations and all that because we're going to be covering a lot of things today. Some of it is inconsequential to the work we're doing. A lot of it's just story because we see the human as mind, body, spirit, you know, and, and with that, we see that as three different beings that make up the human. There's the soul who's always on board with whatever's in the highest and best good. There is the mind, the ego, um, you know, everything that makes our personality as a human. And then there is the innate consciousness of the body. And so the soul is always on board for what's in the highest and best. So is the innate consciousness of the body because the body wants to be in balance. It wants to be in alignment with the soul. It's always the mind that we're working on for the human. And that includes programs, beliefs, um, the emotional fields, lifetimes of trauma, just all the different things that we find that make up the mind that can do things like block our abundance because we are all infinitely abundant in this world but we create blocks to all of that energetic flow. And I'm talking about energetic abundance, not you know money coming in, that's just part of that abundance. Um, so as we work with the, the mind, body, spirit, um, a lot of the stories and things are gonna be geared for the mind to grasp, and then we're gonna be doing the meditations, um, and we're gonna be anchoring that all into the body. Uh, so, Basically, we are going to be going through our physical and clearing out all of the space holders for all of the junk. So we're going to be dropping a lot of junk today. That is the name of healing and clearing is just releasing um, so that we, we're not weighted down by the lifetimes of trauma drama and programs and beliefs and contracts and all the stuff. So. Um, so that brings us back around to working with uh, my sister Brenda. So Brenda is one of the most heart-centered beings on the planet that I know of. She is so in the heart in alignment with her higher soul self that she doesn't get taken down the strange rabbit holes of belief. Because humans are a funny thing in that we are hardwired to make things up and believe them to be true based on experiences, past experiences, things that we perceive with our filters. And, you know, so we like to say that 
all reality is very true. Each reality is very much a true thing. But is it really in alignment with, you know, the soul, something bigger? And that's where I see my sister helping me keep on my path um, is not getting taken down all the strange rabbit holes that you run into. So um, with that, that is part of being in the sacred space of the heart. So a lot of the work that we do today is based, well, actually all the work that we're going to do today is based on the things that my sister and I have worked on together and that my sister brings through from her higher soul self. Um, like I say, she used to channel the Elders Three. Um, she really hasn't in quite some time because she's channeling more of her soul. And in the beginning too, um, she got her spiritual two by four back in about 2000. And that's when she woke up. And um, you know, she's humble country gal, always had bars, restaurants for all these years and um, raises high vibration beef cattle. Um, and so once she started to do, uh, once she started to get into this, she would have Metatron and Thoth would come to her all the time, you know, and she'd be like, wow, who are you guys, you know? And so she really started to work with uh, Metatron and Thoth. Um, and if you are not familiar with them, Metatron is, he's known as like Archangel Metatron. He's, um, you know, he's known in all different um, religious beliefs and, and all over the world. Um, people see this giant blue being or else for me a lot of times I'll see him working with people who are very connected and see sacred geometries and things like that in their world. Metatron is very much a part of them. I'll always see him stepping out of a huge Merkaba field and working with people. Um, the Merkaba, I just want to make sure that you guys did grab all of the um, handouts that are up front there. And we'll, if not, we'll get some of those here later when we get into there. Um, but, so anyway, uh, as Brenda has been growing and coming more into her power, all of her guides are stepping back. You know, all of these beings no longer work with her because she is so in touch with the soul. And, um, and it's, it's pretty interesting when she channels her soul because you can just feel the room shift when it comes in and it's it's it, it's quite a powerful thing and so that's what the whole goal of everything here today is is to allow us to clear our channels dump our junk get that higher perspective in alignment with each and every one of your souls and to be able to bring in your light more than what we've ever carried in the human before and this results in all the healing all of the higher knowing. I mean, so the reason why we do any of this work is, is to just step up into our own light and into our own power and become the creators that we are here to, to be. And so by the end of the day, we are going to be doing some fun stuff like uncreating creation, which no longer serves us on a soul level. And so that's going to be the first step we take as creators is getting rid of the things that no longer serve us. Um, so before we go much farther into all the heady stuff, we'll go ahead and work with the sacred space of the heart. Now, the sacred space of the heart is, heart math is a more of a science-based um, community that works, that they have shown electromagnetics of the heart. So the heart is a huge electromagnetic generator. It creates this torus, this tube torus, which is a toroidal field. It's um, this torus, you, if you think of the Earth and how there's the North and South Pole and the electromagnetics flow in that one direction, the torus, it flows in both directions and it spins. So that's what's creating this donut-shaped field, this torus. And so, that is how the electromagnetics of the heart flows. It flows up and around this way and it spins both ways. It is a moving field. And this toroidal field or this torus is the base of all physical matter. All physical matter is in an electromagnetic field. So we have, um, you know, the, the earth to a molecule all contain this same toroidal field, this torus. And 
So within the heart, we have that six foot one, and then there's a smaller one foot wide torus. That is the sacred seat of the heart. Within the physical heart, there are brain cells. We began with our consciousness in the heart. So we see our consciousness as this little ball of light, about the size of a marble. It is what resided in the heart, and until during birth, sometime when we were small, we started to move our consciousness from here up into the brain. And it sits right behind the pineal gland, that little gland right in the middle of the brain, your receptor, your third eye. It sits right behind there, and it looks out our physical eyes, and it sees the world separate from us. Our consciousness also sits there and is influenced by the ego, by programs, beliefs, the emotional field very much influences us when we are here. So throughout, throughout our history as humanity, as we are in the head, we are creating this world out of fear, necessity, survival. That is where we are creating from, is from the head. So we found a way to move into the heart, really simply and easy, taking three breaths, what we call the Trinity breath. And we take these three breaths of grounding to the earth, connecting to creation. And today I'll say creation or source or soul. Um, plug in whatever word you are comfortable with for that higher power, source, soul, creator, God, central sun, whatever that is. Um, because we don't want to, um, you know, trip you up on any kind of beliefs. So today, anything that you hear too, take what resonates. You can replace words. Um, the rest, just leave it. Um, because in even this Trinity breath, we want to make it your own, but we want to keep it simple. And so whatever we do today, it's just kind of the way that we do it. And you just take it and run with it. But it has to be simple because when we are simple, we can stay in the heart. But as soon as we start to complicate matters, we go right to the head. And then we're creating from here again. So the Trinity breath, super simple, easy. We'll take our three breaths to go into the heart space. So we just imagine that the physical heart is your light, your soul's fire. Uh, we call it the seat of the soul there. So if you close your eyes, and you can leave them open if you wish, just closing your eyes and imagining your heart and your light within the heart. Now imagining the heart of the earth, that light within the earth. We're going to take a deep breath and breathe in that light, that love from the earth right up through the feet and right into the heart. Next, we connect with the heart of creation, source, soul, creator, God. Breathing in that light into the heart. And that third breath is breathing in both earth and sky. Breathing both those energies together within the heart and mixing that with you, with your light. So then you become a column of light that is grounded, connected, and you are now in the heart space. So now as you open your eyes, Feel and see if things are different. For most of us, it, our sight is completely different when we are in the heart space. For me, my whole speech, stance, mannerisms, everything changes when I'm in the heart. And so we'll practice this a lot today. And we'll do it in all different ways. And we'll get to where it's just one breath or you just, you know, just have that intention and and there you are, you're in the heart. Um, but we're gonna do some deep exploring of the sacred space of the heart here in a few. Um, so anyway, how does everybody feel about that? Is there anybody here who felt like they didn't quite get there? All right, cool. Well, we're gonna make sure that we get there. You know, um, this all started with uh, Drun Velo Melchizedek was uh, a gentleman, he wrote The Flower of Life, um, he has he used to work with Thoth, and, and, and they brought through the Merkaba, and um, he also worked with another gentleman where they did a similar thing with the Trinity breath. And so when my sister Brenda um, 
when, she, when Thoth came to her, he was teaching her how to do this Merkaba activation and taught her the Trinity breath. Well, actually it was the elders three who taught her the Trinity breath. And, um, and so in the beginning, I was following Drun Valel Melchizedek's work, which is really heady. And, and his way of getting into the sacred space, the heart is very heady. And so I always had to call my sister and said, Brenda, am I in the heart space? I just don't feel it, you know? And, <laughs> and so, yeah, because yeah, I, I was always, you know, very much in the head about it. So we'll, we'll make sure that everybody is getting in the heart space and that they feel it and that they know it. Um, so we'd like to do a couple things while we're standing. And one of them is what we call the infinite heart technique. And it is something that um, we imagine when we're in that heart space and we imagine connecting heart to heart to another person, we, we do this thing called the infinite heart technique where we just imagine this infinity. Come on in, you are perfect timed. All right. Um, so we're just getting started in earnest here. So we'll do the Trinity breath again of going into the heart space. And then when we do, we're going to imagine doing this infinity with each other. And it's a connecting a heart to heart. Now, I like to use my, my hand just to, for a visualization, but you can simply just visualize the connecting of heart to heart. Now, when we do this, we're not connecting junk. So we are connecting soul to soul is actually what we are doing. And so this is just creating that greater container right here for us all just to be connected as the human and as the soul. So again, let's take that, that three breaths to go into the heart. Just You can close your eyes if you wish. And imagine breathing in that light from the earth, connecting heart to heart. Imagine breathing in that light from creation, connecting heart to heart with creation. And breathing both those together within the heart. And that brings you right into that sacred space of the heart. And then as you open your eyes, just imagining doing that infinity, connecting heart to heart with each and every one of us. And we are also going to hold the container for anybody else besides you that may watch this video. And so we go heart to heart with all of those who will step into our container at the future time. And we're holding space for them. All right. So actually, I think um, the next thing is we'll just jump into the, the tensor technology, the tensor rings that we create. Um, we'll just jump a little bit into this because so when I, when I talk about where my sister Brenda and I do, do that energy work, the consciousness work, um, we do that and what we learn along the way, because I mean, it's like we've, we've learned all these different ways to do different kinds of energy work. Mostly it's been the clearing work. Um, for the past decade, that's pretty much where I've been at is, I'd always consider myself like the galactic police because we'd always be running, we'd always run into all different types of beings out there who Basically, we would see them as dark and malicious and, you know, having ill intent with humanity and, and certain people. And so that's the type of work. And that was where I was at, was um, very much tuned into the dark, so to speak. Um, because like in my 20s and 30s, I, you know, I, I've walked a kind of a, a darker path. Um, you know, drugs, alcohol, all the stuff, um, you know, that was part of what I walked in. And, you know, but I always had a good heart throughout it all. You know, I was always a good person, but yet it was always more in the dark. And then as I started to wake up here 11, 12 years ago, I'd have, Ar I'd have uh, Archangel Michael here on my left. And everybody would be like, Michael, why are you so dark? And he's like, well, I am trying to help Brian integrate the dark and the light. And oh man, I, I could not stand that. I was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not touching the dark, you know. I'm all about the light. And, um, and so that was the beginning of this whole concept of duality and transcending duality, which is the name of 
of our of of the work that I'm teaching and doing is the transcending duality. Um, so for me, being in the dark, it was a way for me to step in and not be one in fear and two not in judgment of the dark. Because when when we've done this work over the past ten years. Um, and we see these dark, malicious beings who seem to violate the free will of humanity. And so we do the work. In the beginning, we would go and like bubble up these beings and take them to the central sun for recycling. We're just like, okay, you guys are dark. You guys don't need to be here. Well, after a while, we got the message, hey, do you see the soul spark in there? Everything is divine. And so when we, start to, um, when we started to understand that concept, and we would look at some dark being, we would see a spark of soul in there. And so what we started to do is we just basically amplified that soul spark, grounded, connected, brought in its soul, it dropped its agendas and turned away. It, it stopped doing what it was doing. And so this whole concept of duality um, has been that it's, it's the driving force, it is the motor of creation. So if we consider the yin and the yang, the black and the white, they're always trying to keep balance. This whole universe has in, been in duality. Every lifetime that we have been as a soul in this universe, we've always been in duality. That's just what this entire universe is about. And so just to, and I'm sure that you guys are all on board with the concept that we are older than the earth. We, our soul is infinitely old, that we have been around as a soul being throughout the entire expansion of creation within this universe. We've been here since the beginning as a soul spark. And so, however you, whatever your beliefs are and how you see that, you know, coming from the unity consciousness or whatever, and then we expand out and we are just basically source in little parts of source, and then that is a soul spark, and then that soul incarnates throughout all, all, of, all of existence here. And so when we do the work anymore, we're doing more than just for ourselves in this lifetime. We're doing it for more than just us as we've been incarnate on this planet. This is, we're, we're doing this work here as humanity and on this planet for the entire universe. That's, that's what we truly believe is that the earth is very much on that leading edge of the expansion of creation. And we were doing things that have not been done anywhere in this universe before. And part of that is, is that we are bringing in our light more than what we've ever carried as a human in any incarnation right now. Because right now is the time that we are stepping out of duality. So going back to duality, we have the black and the white. It, has, it tries to keep balance. And that has always been the motivation and driving force of creation. And even us, as we have been creating from the head, as we were talking about our consciousness being here, and we are creating out of fear, necessity, survival. And so as we start to move into the heart where we are more supported, and when we start to create from here, it is creating an entirely different world. It is creating a world that is not based in fear, necessity, survival. It is based in... I don't know, if maybe you want to call it unity consciousness. I never use those words, but you know, that might be what it is. We are creating from a space that is good for all. Um, so with, uh, with, with that whole concept and the work that my sister and I did, you know, of, of doing all this clearing work, I'll just give you guys a quick background of some of the stuff that, you know, that I do. Um, so, some, I'm a Reiki master as well. I was actually attuned to be a Reiki master before I really even knew energy. It was just kind of one of the first things that happened when I moved to my tiny town. Mary, who works for us, a um, few of you guys might know Mary at our, at our um, at Twisted Sage Studios, very heart center gal. Her and her husband attuned me to a Reiki master, you know, in the very beginning. And that was, you know, when I was just first starting to wake up. Um, my first experience of, of waking up was my sister did healing work with me and she did it by distance and you know I always knew that she was into all this woo-woo stuff and um, you know and when she did this healing work with me it just totally flipped that right side of my brain it just popped 
and there's no going back once you do that. You know, um, you just become open to more. And so that, that was my first experience. And I found out that my mom and my sister had been doing like ghost busting for all these years and doing all this energy work. And I was like, wow. And so, you know, I really started to get into it. And that's when um, I started to get excited about the work that my sister was doing, especially after I found June Below Melchizedek. And I found all the similarities of what he was teaching and what Brenda was bringing through. You know, it is it, because she started working with Thoth, and Thoth was one who worked with Drunvalo, um, and then Thoth left Drunvalo about the same time he came to my sister um, in 1999, and um, so it was just the synchronicity is right there, and it's just been a fast path since. Part of this path has been that clearing work. So again, um, I really. So, because that was what I was supposed to do is all that dark clearing work. So I'd be walking down the street and somebody would say something really strange to me and I would turn around to look and it was an entity. It was an entity attachment. Um, we call an entity basically a non-incarnate being who influences people. And so um, that was where I did my work and that I thrived was doing the clearing work of these non-beneficial energy attachments for people. And then, you know, that's where we started to do all of our work way out there is just all these different races of beings and planets and galaxies and everything else that were affecting people here on the planet. And that's, that's the clearing work that I did and I really enjoyed it. You know, it was just, it was always a challenge and, you know, um, the things that my sister and I have done, oh gosh, I would love to write a Star Wars book about it because it's pretty wild stuff. Um, but anyway, that, that whole time, it was about seeing things in a higher and higher perspective. So as we start to get into this higher perspective, that's when we were able to see these, these beings that appeared to be dark and malicious and seeing that they were simply playing their part in the creation. They were playing their part in duality. And so that's it, is that there, there's always been that black and that white. And that, that's just the way that it's always been in this universe, is that duality. Um, you know, you have the dark and you have the white, and the white is that self-righteous one who just denies the dark. He's like, no, no, that was me in the beginning when they told me about Michael being so dark. I was like, no, 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 I don't want no dark. My mom does that, she, she's, uh, you know, and she used to, and she would actually, you know, create, she would create things that were dark because, and she would just, um, they would come back to haunt her because basically she was just denying all of that stuff. Um, you know, so, so there's the black and the white, and um, where we're at right now is there is this new, we call it the chalice energy. It is a crystal clear, pure consciousness light. And so if we have a black and a white marble, this chalice energy is just, it's just crystal clear. And as it comes in, it does not take on anything with the dark. It doesn't try to fight the dark. It doesn't take on the, you know, any characteristics of the light. It just is. And it, as it, as it just exists and it is there, the black and the white release and then everything changes. So this chalice energy, it's something that um, was carried by the Essenes and then the Knights Templars, you know, the chalice, you know, that whole concept. But this energy has been here in the universe since the beginning. It has just stayed in the undercurrents. But just recently it is coming up and people are noticing this clear, pure light around all physical things on this planet and through the universe now. And with this chalice energy um, and this whole new paradigm of just being and not, not the doing, and that's been a huge thing in this past two years, is we've just, you know, the spiritual two by fours, we just get pummeled until we surrender. I mean, for like my sister, it's three o'clock in the morning and she thought she was going to die and she said, okay, fine, you know, and she was going through a lot that whole week and we just could not get it clear. And then finally, she's just like, okay, I surrender. If I, if I have to die, that's fine. I surrender. 
as soon as she surrendered, it was wild because everything just shifted. Everything shifted. And um, that has been a, a big lesson that I know a lot of us have had, if you look back on it especially, is being made to surrender. And the surrender is a surrendering to the soul. I mean, it's, it's a surrendering to that higher, that higher path, getting out of our rabbit holes and surrendering to there. And um, so this part, that's where this chalice energy came in is because it's no longer a doing, it's just a surrendering. And we've seen this crystal clear, pure light, we've seen it uncreate creation. Um, that's, that's been huge. It's been uncreating things that no longer serve us. So instead of doing healing work, um, you know, for anything specific anymore, my sister, all she does is she goes soul to soul, brings in the innate consciousness of the, of the body, um, and then she brings in the soul, and then she talks to the human about it, you know, because mind, body, spirit. And um, she just holds that space of the chalice, and then that's where the healing takes place. Um, so... Sorry for jumping around on a lot of concepts, but we're going to keep jumping around on a lot of concepts today, and we're going to come back, and, and, you, and you might see them all tie together here. So we're going to go back to the tensor tools. So, because uh, I just kind of had to throw all those things in so we could tie it in. Um, so that's why we're getting the video here, too, so that way you guys can kind of go through and pull it all together if we don't here today. Um, so the tensor rings, it was, uh, and you guys heard a few of us talk about slim spurling. So Slim Sperling, he was actually from South Dakota as well. And he rediscovered this technology in the early 90s. It was Slim and a bunch of his friends. They, um, they worked with um, these sacred measures that came from the Great Pyramids. And so there was this uh, gentleman who discovered all these measurements above the king's chamber. And as they were playing with these measurements, they found one of these specific measurements was actually the sine wave of the hydrogen atom. That was really cool. So you can actually cut um, any kind of a rod or a dowel or anything to these specific measurements, and it emits the frequency of hydrogen. And that is super cool. But then he found that there was these measurements that when you cut something to that very specific measurement to the hundred thousandths of a centimeter, and you bring the ends together, it was creating a what they called a light. They could see a light coming out of here. But it was a dualistic nature. One side of this circle would be a positive, and one side would be a negative, so to speak. One would be more life-affirming, and one would be more non-beneficial. You know, so um, Slim found that if you take wire and you twist it in a clockwise fashion, that it was then creating a positive on both sides. So how we make a tensor ring is um, copper itself is a microcrystal. And when they draw a copper wire, it aligns all the crystalline structure in that copper wire. And it creates what's known as a piezoelectric energy flow. That's where, you know, crystals, crystals are emitting a piezoelectric energy. So within the copper wire, there is that energy flow. So we fold the wire in half, we twist it, we cut it to that hundred thousandths of a centimeter, and we bring the ends together. So that way, it is creating a flow of energy one way and the other way both. So it is a counter-rotating vortex. This creates a vortex of light, a column of light. And with the, the frequencies that came from the Great Pyramids, one of those cubit measures out of all those different measurements, only one of them made a working tensor ring. The rest of them you just use in these straight line measurements. So this tensor ring, when uh, Slim first discovered this, they were using an oscillator. Um, gosh, I think that's the name of it. It is a tool that finds the frequency. They found that the frequency of those first rings were 144,000. Uh, 144 megahertz is what the frequency of those first tensor rings were. And they did a lot of research and study. I mean, he even got the military involved with this. And the military actually wanted nothing to do with it because where this creates a light that goes for miles, you cannot send anything negative through this column. So the military could not weaponize tensor technology. So they wanted nothing to do with it. Um, because again, it is a, it's a vortex. It's a, it's a toroidal field. So we were talking about the torus. 
where it spins both ways. This is kind of like a torus too, um, in that it does spin both ways. Um, so Slim worked with a, mathematic a mathematician who um, he figured out a nether frequency based on the sacred measurements, and that one was 177 megahertz. Um, then through the years, we worked with dowsers from all over, and these dowsers have helped us find different measurements. Um, some of the other measurements that we found were one that produces a 333 megahertz, and this one, um, we found that we believe that it came from the, the Temple of Solomon. Um, and so that specific measurement that was used for that temple work produces that 333 megahertz frequency. And those you can even cut in a straight line measurement too, and it also still produces a 333 megahertz frequency. It's kind of like a ham radio. Ham radios, they cut to a specific length, the antennas, and then that antenna creates the frequency. Um, but tensor rings are a way different critter in that you just can't be like, okay, I want to make a 432 megahertz ring and you cut to a measurement, it doesn't work that way. Um, there have, for these sacred measures, it's, it's thought that there have been 64 cubit measures, these are called cubits, these measurements, known to mankind, but very few of them will actually create a working tensor field or even a, um, an energetic when cut to a, a straight line measurement. So the other measurements that we found were, let's see, the, besides the 333 megahertz, the 188 megahertz, then we found a 764 megahertz, which was just a whole nether ring that was a dual ring that has a black hole on one side and it creates this tornado on the other side. We can never figure out what it was. We talked to Slim and he said it was for teleportation and we never have quite figured that one out. Um, but uh, so, so Slim, going back to this, is that Slim Sperling, he died in 2007. And um, after Slim passed, he started to appear to people all over. And people would be like, yeah, there's this really tall, red-headed dude with a beard that keeps showing me this copper ring over water, you know? And um, so it's been really interesting to run into those people where Slim, you know, appears to them. But uh, so this was in 2010 that my sister actually channeled um, the earth elementals. So my, so my sister and the elders three, it was, yeah, it was about 2010 or is 2011 that um, my sister channeled in this, this shape you might know as the Triscalian or the Triscale. And um, when she, she drew it, and um, we called it Hedica. And Hedica is the name of the spirit of water. And so as this Hedica came through, um, it, it was phenomenal. I could not feel energy before we started making these Hedicas. I started making these Hedicas, and it is what broke me open to feeling energy, was these Triscales or Hedicas. Um, and we'll talk more about the earth elementals here later, but when I was getting these out into the world, I was super excited. I'd make hundreds of these driving down the road, you know, driving with my knees, you know. <laughs> but we live in South Dakota where we have four lanes and we're the only one on the road, so it's, it's all good. It's not like I drive through Denver. So um, this was before cell phones, you know. So, um, so the Hedekas, um, as we was getting them out into the world, we ran into all kinds of people who were like, I've been drawing that symbol since I was a kid. Or else, hey, check out my tattoo. And they have it tattooed on their body. Um, there was fishermen on the East Coast who had been making these for decades, and they threw them in their holding tanks to keep the fish alive longer. Um, so there, there was so much about this little symbol, especially made out of copper, but you can make it out of anything, and it's going to emit the energy. Um, and what the channeled information was saying was that it, you know, it is the symbol of, of the spirit of water, and the spirit of water is older than the planet, you know, because it came here to support the planet. You go to other planets and there are different elementals than what are here. But um, so this spirit of water, um, you can drop it into soil and it promotes root growth 15 feet out. Um, it bounces the energetic, uh, it, well, it clears the energetics of water, it brings in more of the consciousness of water into your water, into the physical water. So 
the gals from Dancing with Water, the new science of water, had just written a book that came out in 2010. And they called me up and said, hey, all your channel information backs our science on what this Hedica does. We call it Triscale. And so, you know, they were really fascinated with that whole concept. And then they called me two weeks later and said, well, there's this gentleman who sits on our front porch every night when we come home from work. We're scientists, you know, we don't channel or anything. But there's this gentleman who sits on our porch and his name is Slim Sperling and he has information on, for you on how to make tensor rings. So I got the information from them about tensor technology and started to work with Slim Sperling on the making of tensor rings. And through that time, and that was in 2010, through that time, I've had the remembrances of creating these tools for lifetimes. So an interesting thing with these is that they, they do produce that, that field of energy, but where the true power and potency of these rings lies is in the higher dimensional tool. So where I had been creating these things for lifetimes, I wasn't creating rings, I was creating higher dimensional tools. So where our tools are at housed in this higher dimensional plane, they are housed in underneath of a pyramid, under a dome. There's all these master beings there. Our one guardian of these tools is named Heimdall. Heimdall, he's, um, if you've ever seen the movie Thor, he's that, that really badass gatekeeper of the rainbow bridge with his sword and he can see everything. And you know, so that's, that's Heimdall. He is in that tradition of Thor and all those guys. Heimdall's an Arcturian, you know, which I guess I would make Thor and Odin Arcturians too. But um, so anyway, Heimdall is the guardian and protector of all of our etheric tools that we create here. So to give an example, um, once we started working with all the earth elementals, which I'll talk more about all the different earth elementals, we would take, um, we would ask them to be in the etheric templates. So then, within this column of light, you can find the frequencies and properties and the consciousness of water, air, fire, ether, all of that is found in here. Um, so that's what we put into the etheric templates. And so this, again, is an antenna. So this antenna, even though it creates this beautiful tensor field and everything, again, the true power and potency lies in all the consciousness that comes in here to assist. So you have the consciousness of water in here and of fire and all of that. Well, along the way, we kept getting hit with what we call energetic implants, etheric implants. There were things that would come in and, you know, maybe your shoulder would get dislocated or you feel like you had a pin in it or, you know, weird stuff like that on the physical. And my sister was always, um, you know, we always called her kind of like the canary in the coal mine because she would always get hit with all of these things and then we'd have to come in and try to clear them. So these energetic implants, you know, um, as they would come in and they would cause physical sensations and we would see them and we would see them, you know, like maybe an energetic rod stuck into your shoulder. Um, and so we would simply start clearing those out. And what that was is, is that as we raised in frequency and vibration, then those things started to be not in that same vibration and that's why we would find them. So some of these things, so. Let's step back and remember, so that we don't go into fear with this, that your soul is in charge of everything. That even any of these things that happen to us, our soul is the one that was like, yeah, cool, let's, let's do this. You know, So nothing happens to you that your soul does not agree on. You are not a victim and you know, that's, that's that, you're not a victim. So everything that happens, even in life, it is part of your soul path, and I know you guys all know this, um, but just a reminder so that anything that you know, we talk about today that you don't fall into fear about this because it, it's, it's part of a greater thing. Um, so some of these energetic implants, like what I had, was where I had a sheath on a whole half of my left side, and my soul put it there, and it was like a protector um, for me, and so it had been there for lifetimes. And then as I started to grow in frequency and vibration, then we'd find all these things and we'd clear them. So 
for many years, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and if I didn't have an energetic implant, I was like, man, I must not have raised in frequency and vibration last night. What's up? <laughs> you know? And so it was just all the time. And so I was like, okay, there has to be a way to clear these energetic implants. So I went to one of my favorite crystal shops and I said, okay, what kind of things can clear an energetic implant? And so she gave me this whole long list of crystals and I bought all these crystals and, um, because actually right before that, my sister, I was making one of these tensor rings for her singing bowl, her crystal singing bowl. So I was told to make a ring for her and I was told to put the energetics of water into it. So we twist up this wire and I would sit there with this whole 20, 30 foot long piece of copper wire and I would run it underwater physically in the sink. And just because that was my way that I could at the time put the energetics of water into the copper was actually running it underwater with the intention of bringing through the frequencies of water into the copper. And it was really fun because we noticed that it actually made the copper harder. It hardened up the crystal structure of the copper by putting the energetics of water into it. And so it affected the physical and we're like, wow, that is just, you know, that's super cool. And so then still above the sink in the back shop, I have that whole list of crystals because at first then I took the crystals, this whole handfuls, and run water and no crystals and I had somebody else drag the copper wire across there and we were putting the energetics of all the crystals and the water into that copper wire. And um, <laughs> we were like, God, there's got to be an easier way to do this. And it was, you know, and just it, because that was what we had to do at first. So it was the intention. So then I kept that list of the crystals and the water, and it was just my intention to bring those into the copper. So then that could help us to clear energetic implants on the body because we're bringing the frequencies and properties of the copper into it. Then we discovered the etheric templates. That is where they are up here housed and guarded in that dome pyramid. And so that's where we in earnest really started to work with the tools is creating all those etheric templates. So then it was just game on. We started to put everything that we learned in there, whether it was clearing soul shards, you know, um, or doing the release of, you know, anything. So anything that my sister and I learned along the way, we put into the etheric templates so that anybody could access that here. Now, going back to the tensor rings, and we were doing, um, we were, dowsers were bringing in the different measurements for us. So we had five or six measures. But then our friend Marty Lucas, some of you guys might know Marty Lucas in radionics, um, Marty and Scott Ertl actually were dowsing one day to find a measurement that would be beneficial for dairy cows. They came up with this measurement that was the galactic ring. And we, so it was, it was, we just called it the galactic ring. That ring was super special. It did not have a single frequency in it, like 177 megahertz, anything like that. It had multiple frequencies in multiple fields. And interesting thing was is that when you hold it, we could see that there were other soul aspects of you. And this is my first experience with soul aspects, other incarnations of me that were right here at the same time I was holding onto this. I could see that there was 12 of us right here holding onto this ring. And that was super cool because it was bringing more of us in. And so then it came to be that there was all those frequencies and properties in the ring and we started putting everything in there. But we were seeing that it was the soul that determined what frequencies and properties come through. So you could not get a static measurement on what frequency was coming out of that ring. It would contain all the frequencies before, like the 144 megahertz, the 177, all the frequencies and properties of the crystal kingdom, all the plant kingdom, uh, all the earth elementals, and then all the different modalities that we learned along the way we put in there. And then it was just so busy in there, but it was like a smart ring in that your soul is the one who determines what comes through for you at any given time. So it is always different. So that galactic ascension ring, we called it, was our first smart ring, basically. And that, that was a huge step. And then it, things just kept going after that. We found um, there was a gentleman, uh, Scott Miller, who uh, just recently passed, but he helped to bring in the 
um, standard Teotihuacan unit. It's short STU for short. It is a measurement that was used to build the city of Teotihuacan and other megalithic structures on the planet. And so that sacred measurement we called the balance and harmony ring. And that was a phenomenal ring because we just kept adding more stuff energetically, etherically into that ring. And then the next huge step was the golden fire. Um, so the, well, I'm not sure whether to talk about the golden fire yet or not. Yeah, I guess we will. So the golden fire is the sacred heart. We have the sacred space of the heart that we moved into, but then there's the sacred heart. The sacred heart is what you always see Jesus and Mary depicted with, that trifold gold flame heart. That's the sacred heart. We were with our friend Jeanette Crowley, not related to Alistair Crowley. She's the one who wrote The Eagle and the Condor. She does Soul Body Fusion as her other book and her modality. Um, she's out of Colorado, but we were doing um, a workshop with her and it was three years ago. Actually, we're just having a three-year anniversary sale on the Golden Fire tools right now. So it was uh, three years ago that we were on our way back from this workshop. And, um, well, okay. At the workshop, um, this Jeanette, she channels an energy group called Mark. They're from the Great White Brotherhood. They're just, um, she's been mapping out dimensions of consciousness for 36 years. And um, so it's all about expanding consciousness and working through the dimensions of consciousness. And um, so working with her, I heard Mark come in and tell Brenda to stand in the back of the room to hold space. And I saw Brenda get up. She went in the back of the room, held space. We were taking a journey that day where we took the Pope's keys, the gold and the silver key. We went to the gates of heaven. We said, we have the key. We went through. You're not supposed to go through unless you are, you're not supposed to go through while you're incarnate. We went through. We had the silver key. We said, we have the key. We went through. We ran into a third gate, a big red fiery gate and a big red fiery dragon garden. It. Oh, that must be the gates of hell. Well, we don't have a key, so we are the key. We went through that third gate and we received the sacred heart activation. And that was huge. Um, so once that golden fiery heart came in, it's that Christ consciousness. Um, and this has not been active in the human for who knows how long, maybe never, um, who knows. But anyway, so this golden fire came through. And so then on the way home, um, we were like, okay, we want to make a ring with this. We want to bring this energy out so everybody can access this. And so, um, so it was really cool because there was this being on the way home, you know, we do my best work driving. My sister was with me and this being came out and he showed us this long golden rod. And we sat there and we started guessing the measurement in millimeters and finally we guessed it right, you know. And then after we guessed it right, then he grabbed that rod and he brought it into a circle and it became this blue neon circle. And um, that was where the etheric template of the golden fire first came through. Um, so an interesting story is that after I started to find out about Ghost Waywards, my daughter, who's now 11, when she was first born, um, she had night terrors all the time. And it was because this tiny little house that we lived in, in Buffalo Gap, South Dakota, it used to be the biggest town in the Midwest, and we lived in this old brothel and, uh, from the 1800s. And, um, and there was just, you know, it was just ghosts, waywards all the time. And so I started to learn how to do ghost busting which is simply connecting to a disincarnate spirit because when you die as a human, you have the choice, free will still, if you want to cross over or if you stay here. Most beings will choose to stay here um, for reasons of unfinished business. Um, you know, so a lot of ghost waywards that we would run, to, run into are your great, great, great grandfather who stayed for your great, great, great grandmother. She died, she said, oh, no, screw this, I'm going home. She took off and he was stuck there. And when you are a disincarnate being, you have to take energy from people or places in order to still survive, in order to be on that plane. And so the, they would attach to people. So people would have these energy attachments and a lot of them are their relatives from way back or else maybe they're just coming off the street. So that's why for if you find ghosts, they're usually in a geographic location because they will wander the, the different geomagnetic lines and so they, some houses are just more haunted than the others because they are on these geomagnetic lines where the ghosts wander. 
Um, and then some people are just magnets for them. But anyway, my daughter could see this. Most kids can, as do cats and dogs, and a lot of people. Um, so I started getting into the ghost busting, which was simply going to that disincarnate spirit. And, and I did it the old way that they used to teach in the UK, because the UK, in the UK, they, that was really a big thing, um, doing this work. And they call it spirit release, I think, there. But basically, you would have to go and talk them into going into the light. So I'd always bring in Archangel Raphael to do healing with them, and I'd have Archangel Michael open the portal of the light and, um, and talk them into going across. And once you start to see these and do that work, you're just flooded. You know, so it used to be like going to Walmart and I'd have to tell them all the way in my car until I can come back and deal with them because I was doing it the long hand version, you know, talking them into the lights and doing healing and, you know, so um, it got to be, I was like, no, we got to find a tool that can just cross these guys over. And that's what the golden fire did. So then the golden fire rings um, that are cut to that specific measure and connected to that etheric template of the golden fire, when a ghost or a wayward or, okay, so any being comes into this field, the soul comes in to activate the sacred heart because it's your soul that activates your sacred heart. So a ghost or a wayward would step into this column, his soul would come in to activate the sacred heart and just take it home. Simple as that. You didn't have to talk it into going, you didn't have to do the healing work with it, anything. It would just go. And so that was a huge thing for us, um, the golden fire. So that was our, our next ring. Um, <clears throat> and we'll do the golden fire activation here in a minute. But we'll just keep going on tensor rings here. Um, so the next, no, actually, we're going to do the sacred heart activation because we need to kind of break things up a little bit. So we're going to do the sacred heart activation. Um, super simple, easy stuff. All right, so close your eyes again, if that's how you wish to do it. And we are going to journey into the heart again. So taking that breath from the earth, going heart to heart with the earth, breathing in that unconditional healing love of Gaia right into the heart. Connecting heart to heart to creation, your soul, God, breathing in that unconditional loving energy into the heart. Breathing them both in, mixing earth and sky with you. You become a column of light that's grounded and connected. Now imagine your soul before you. Your soul can present in any ways. It could be an orb or just a feeling or maybe it's a being of light. Your soul puts its hand on your heart and activates the golden fire. Take that deep breath in. Allow the soul to activate that sacred heart. And it's not a trying or a doing. It's simply an attention and an allowing. Allowing of your soul to come in and activate that sacred heart. Now using your imagination, imagine that golden fire or that golden light or however it presents to you. Imagine it flowing into the body, into every cell of the body, in between every cell, all the way to your toes, all the way to your fingertips. Using your imagination or your visualization of anything in the physical, an ache or a pain, or maybe an emotion that comes up, and just imagine wrapping that up with that golden fire, that golden light. And then just letting it go. All right, coming back into the heart and then opening your eyes again and being here and in that space. That golden fire will stay in the heart forever. It is always there now. You don't have to ever do that activation again and you guys are all carrying it. So no worries if you feel like you did not get it, you have it. That is a huge healing energy. Um, and now, too, as a ghost and a wayward comes into your field, just imagine that golden fire and imagine expanding that golden fire out, and it'll affect those around you. 
And actually, those around you, it will even activate their sacred heart if their soul chooses. It's between them and their soul. But as people come into your field, their soul will have the remembrance of that sacred heart and it can do the activation that's between them. Um, most people, it happens because most people are ready for this. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's the sacred heart. And so that's what we put into, now that's in all the tools, the golden fire. Um, so let's, uh, oh, let's move on to some other fun stuff here. We'll just keep talking about the tools for a little bit, and then we're gonna do some really deep work before lunch. And then after lunch, we'll do some other stuff, but I'll, I'll try to knock you guys out before we go to lunch here. Um, so I guess I just kind of wanted to, for an example, and I usually, I don't talk too much about the tools just because they're, um, I don't wanna be like a, uh, um, an infomercial, you know, for the tools. But the tools do, uh, the tools are training wheels, and that's it, is that training wheels are great, they're, they're, they're space holders, we call these tools anything that we create with the tensor fields. We just simply call tools. And, you know, we can do everything that the tools do, you know, we just have to know about it, we have to be attuned to it, we have to have the activations. So an activation is what we just did with the Sacred Heart that activated the sacred heart. We're gonna do some other activations here in a bit. But then an attunement is kind of like a Reiki attunement. You, you attune, you, you align up and know what something is so that you know that. And when you know that, you're attuned to it. These are all quantum tools. That just simply means that you can attune to them and you can bring them in and imagine them and they are there. So we're gonna be doing that too is we're gonna have some attunements to some of our tools to where you can use it, but not have to have a physical one because you are attuned to the energetic aspect. Um, but to go on about the tensor rings and the newer frequencies and where we are going out with consciousness. So we found that chalice energy that I was speaking about about a, almost a year ago, a little bit less. And that chalice energy is in these rings. And basically some of the work that we're gonna be doing here at the very end of the day is bringing in that chalice to where we are the chalice as our physical body and our soul is gonna bring that energy in and that's gonna allow us to do some really fun stuff on, like I said, uncreating creation. Then um, one of the newer rings is the harmonizer ring. And this one, so if we consider that this is an electromagnetic universe, everything has an electromagnetic field. We were talking about the toruses and the toruses create an electromagnetic field. And so, Everything in physical reality is an electromagnetic field. And so electromagnetics inherently are not good or bad. Um, actually, inherently, they are good. So this ring here, this harmonizer ring, exists between this whole plane of electromagnetics and frequency and light, all of that is here in this certain plane. We get above this dimensional cloud layer space and we get into this space where it's just pure consciousness there's no light there's no electromagnetics it's just it's just pure consciousness and that is where we begin um, as a soul um, so this acts as like it sits right up there on that ceiling and i call it a cosmic blender because it, it looks like a blender where it is taking all of that which is non-physical non-electromagnetic and it is basically anchoring it into the things that are physical and electromagnetic. So it just brings it all together. And so um, when we use it with the other rings, it, it brings it more into the physical. This third ring of this trio, which we call the alchemist set, which is you know the same as a lot of the pendants some of us are wearing, it has those three different rings, which we call the alchemist set, which is sum of greater than the whole. But this other one is the divine I am, and this is the divine I am is simply the energy of the soul. And so this is gonna feel different to every person because it is you, it is your soul, it is your light that is in here. Um, and we're gonna do some playing with the large sets of rings and we're gonna scan each other and do chakra alignments and all the fun stuff with those here in a minute. But um, so 
I just wanted to bring this up because this is part of the consciousness work that we do. And that is, um, you know, because my passion is going way out, you know, going as far as I can and then bringing it in and putting it into the tools to make it accessible for other people. So that's, you know, that's why the tools is a part of of what we teach and what we do and the consciousness work that we do is because we anchor all of that into the physical tools. Um, so let's see. Just want to make sure, are we stopping at 12 or 12.30 today? Okay, perfect. So tensor tools, um, we're gonna talk about sacred space and we're gonna do a Merkaba activation too here in a, in a moment. So sacred space, um, you know, you always hear about people talking about holding space and you hear about sacred space and, and all of that. So it's um, part of the analogy is with these rings in that the older rings, like the 144 megahertz ring, they would, they would hold a space. And that's what I call these, is space holders. In that within those columns of frequency, there's, there's a certain field, a certain energetic field. And some of them contain more than others. Like our older rings don't contain the consciousness of the earth elementals or of all the plant crystal kingdoms, all that stuff. So that was one space that you could hold that was, it's a, harmo it's a harmonious space. And that is why these tools work so well is that it is creating a, um, a coherency to everything. And that's why they work with electromagnetics is that they are bringing a coherency to an electromagnetic field. That is the only reason that some electromagnetics are non-beneficial to our electromagnetic being is because a cell phone or other man-made things, electromagnetic fields, are disharmonious. And as they come in, they affect us. And so that's why we make like cell phone tabs because they are taking, the tensor fields are taking a disharmonious field and they are harmonizing it to be a more beneficial field. I sleep with my cell phone next to me at night and I'm pretty sensitive to these things, to electromagnetics on frequencies um, because it harmonizes them. But anymore, I don't even need that cell phone tab. I just kind of have it to show because I've got my body and trained in my mind knowing that I don't, you know, that I can handle this on my own, that my field is strong enough, that I stand in my power enough that these things don't affect me. Again, these are training wheels for us. Um, it's not meant to be reliant upon them, um, you know, for a long time. So, um, oh my, I just seem to get really lost easy here because um, there's so many different streams going. Um, so is, where were we at? Oh my goodness. Um, we were talking about sacred space and holding space and the different flavors of that space. So that's, that was the point I was trying to make was like some of the older rings would, as just an analogy, would hold a certain space. Some of the newer rings hold a higher space like the chalice ring, it holds that higher space. So when we hold space as consciously, so we talk about holding space and I was telling you earlier how Brenda doesn't do specific work anymore. Like, you know, I used to be able to just text her when I have a rib out and I can feel her coming in and pushing my rib back into place. You know, quick, easy, simple, just like that. Because she was doing. Anymore, if I have a rib out, I'll call her, and you know, you just feel a space come around, and then it's just, it's done. You don't feel it going back into place, it just is there. You know, for an example. And so, that is what she does, is she holds space, and she holds such a high space that things happen and shift because it's just like a tensor ring. If you stand in one of these large rings, it is going to bring you into alignment. I mean, we've done uh, biofeedback studies like with a cell tab. It aligns chakras, energy bodies, makes organs function better, clears the mental and emotional fields, all of that on biofeedback. Of course, we see it doing a lot more, you know, spiritually with the soul and everything. So basically when you stand within this field, this space, it harmonizes everything here in the physical, mental, emotional, everything that the human is. But we can do that through consciousness and through the sacred space of the heart. 
One huge thing about the sacred space of the heart, you guys, is, is that this is where we are supported. When we go into the heart space, we are not influenced by the ego and the, the ego, the emotions, all that. Within the sacred space of the heart can only be those who walk with you in the highest and best. So we're also going to do some journey work to where we go into the sacred space of the heart and that is where you can go for your answers. That is where you can go to connect more with your higher soul self. Um, and then when we work from that space, so when we're going to do our distance healing, when we're going to invite other people in, we're going to be working from that sacred space of the heart. And two, with the sacred space of the heart, it is an important thing to do before you do anything. So you're dowsing. You're dowsing. When you douse, you're here. You're getting influenced by all the stuff. That's why when dowsing, we don't ask the questions that are emotional reactive to us because we'll always pop into the head and we will always influence our dowsing or your radionics. It'll influence your radionic broadcast too. Um, so anything that we do, making a decision, go into the heart space because we're not being influenced. So this is pertinent to daily living, being in the heart. And we can go with the three breaths and we'll be in our heart until, you know, like maybe you get cut off in traffic and you're like, ah, oh, damn it. You know, and you're just, you're, you're out of your heart space. Um, so it's an exercise. So the more you do it, you just get back in there. You just get back in there. And, um, and so it, it is so important to be in the heart with anything that we do. Um, so we're going to take another deeper journey into the heart space. So we're going to spend a few minutes here on this journey. So get comfortable and here we go. So most of you are still in the heart, but we're going to use our imagination and visualization. When we use our imagination and visualization, when we are in the heart space, that is when we are supported in creation. Oh my, can we create when we are in the heart space because we are supported and it is an alignment. So imagine your heart, taking your breath in from the earth, breathing that into the heart, your breath in from source, soul, creation, breathing that into the heart. Now as your consciousness is there in that heart space, using your imagination, you're going to find a space within your heart. Some people see this space as like a cave. Maybe it's an ocean beach. Maybe it's your favorite spot on nature. This sacred space that is yours. Within that sacred space, you will find a place to sit. That is the seat of the heart. This could be a pile of sand, a milking stool, a pile of furs, whatever it is. Imagine settling yourself down onto that sacred seat of the heart. And if you don't have visualizations and imaginations, it's just the intention and just the knowing and allowing that it is taking place. As you settle into that sacred seat of the heart, perhaps you can look around and see other beings or what your environment looks like. Anybody that is within your sacred seat of the heart, your sacred space, are there for you in the highest and best. Only those that are there for your highest and best can be there. Some people may have a telephone hanging on the wall that they can ask questions. Some people may just be in that beautiful, serene spot. Perhaps you look up and you see all the constellations of the world. So while you're in the heart space, in that sacred space of the heart, you can ask all those who walk with you in your highest and best good to be there. 
your team, your soul aspects, whoever they are. And it's a great place to be in communication. This is the seat of creation for you, the sacred space of the heart. start bringing your attention back to your physical body, checking in with yourself, checking in with your body. Again, if you have any little aches or pains or twitches of any kind, send your light to it. Your light and the golden fire are all as one now. And just shine your light on it. Most things just want our a divine attention. You are bringing your a divine attention to whatever it is, and that will shift it. Wow, I can feel you all doing major shifts. So we're going to come back to this here now in this room and this is a journey that you guys can do on your own and you know when you do this before you go to bed at night it's huge if you have a hard time getting to sleep go into the heart space going into the heart space before you go to sleep is a fantastic experience because you may wake up there and you may receive so much more from your soul at night and your team, those who walk with you and those who walk with those who walk with you. You have a lot of support. So that is a sacred space. Right there. And it's a safe space. Again, Nothing else can come into that space. So that is a safe, sacred space to be. 